Coming up on this week's show, Bleem is back, but not as we remember it. Fake PS1 discs are flooding the market. And we chat strategic simulations and Saints Row with Dan Serma. And the Retro Hour podcast is brought to you each and every Friday with our amazing friends at Bitmap Books. Now, of course, we are into spooky season, Halloween, just a couple of weeks away. And to celebrate that, one of their books you've got to check out, From Ants to Zombies, Six Decades of Video Game Horror, covering all the big horror games from the 70s right up to the 2020s, over 70 hardware platforms and more than 130 horror titles analysed and contextualised across 600 beautifully illustrated pages. If you're a fan of horror games, you've got to check this out. And the rest of their retro gaming collection, head to their website, bitmapbooks.com. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 450. Your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And a very warm welcome to the podcast, a show that every single Friday, of course, completely geeks out about all things retro gaming and technology related, brings you up to speed on all the big happenings in the amazing world of retro from over the last week and brings you veterans of the industry onto the podcast each week for an interview in the second half of the show. Um, I'm hoping as well we're not going to get too sleepy on this week's episode because we have got a bit of a storm going on right now. It's kind of like listening to my uh, my ambient sounds app that I play the, to the fall asleep at night. The storm sends you to sleep. That's yeah, weird, Dad. I'm like, one of those people who I can't fall asleep if it's quiet. I've got to have like rain sound effects on my Alexa. I'm on edge. I'm like, <laughs> am I going to get struck by lightning? What's going on? <laughs> Through the I window. Can the, <laughs> I can hear the rain outside Ravi's window when we started recording. I was like, ah, that sounds nice. Yeah. Well, you guys so. talking about horror. I don't know if someone's just going to press up against that window it's at least yeah, get during the thunderstorm so if you need loud bangs or clatters just thunder and lightning outside the window it is that time of year now and uh, the final event I think we're going to be at this year you guys are going to be um, very close to home we're going to be in Nottingham this weekend aren't you at the uh, Nottingham Gaming Market yes the uh, Nottingham Gaming Market is actually landing we've not had a really big gaming market uh, for a long time in Nottingham and and this is done by the guys that you know do the Doncaster Gaming Market which is Really big as well. Uh, replay events. And play Expo, um, of course. Play Expo, yes, uh, which lots of people have been to and they've been enjoying um, last week, actually. So, uh, you know, they've been pretty busy, these guys. And um, it's on the 13th of October uh, on the Sunday at the Harvey Haddon uh, Sports Village, which I used to go to Harvey Haddon when I was a kid. Um, yeah. and Karate classes? Yeah, 11 till 4. So I'm going to be there with Amiga Addict magazine. And uh, Joe, you're going to be there as well, aren't you? Yeah, I'll be there. I'll be there from opening, as I always, as I always am at these things. I'm going to be on my uh, friend's table, Days of Days of Thunder. Uh, I'm going to be flogging a few of my repeats as well. Giving a his of uh, huge retro hour discount to listeners. <laughs> oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> All you got to do is go to Joe and say, you're, you're our favourite member of the Retro Hour. Get a selfie yeah. with him. That's it, isn't it? Big discount. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, guys. So I'll, I'll link that up in the show notes. If you're anywhere near Nottingham this weekend, they want to come say hi to the guys. They're going to be there. I'm back home for my mum's birthday. Couldn't convince her to come to the uh, Nottingham Gaming Market for her birthday, unfortunately. But um, uh, I'm sure you guys will have fun. So if you to check that out, link in the show notes. Right then, let's get into this week's guest, because um, you've got an amazing one that you guys recorded when I was on my holidays a couple of weeks ago. Looking forward to hearing this one with Dan Cermak. Yeah, Dan is absolutely amazing. I've wanted to get him on the podcast for a long time. Um, he's basically worked in, in in a very varied kind of video game world. Um, you know, he was the, the VP of Strategic Simulations, Inc. as well, who are, are very famous for the kind of strategy games that they used to create back in the days. Um, You know, he's a collector of war board games as well and Mm. uh, kind of medieval board games. And we talk about how strategy games changed over time, how how stuff like 3D came in and, uh, you know, how they were also rivaling many companies at the time, Micropros as well, who were producing stuff. But then he later went on uh, to... Create some pretty amazing titles as well. Uh, the Punisher, which mm. was one on the PlayStation 2. I know you love that game, Joe. Yeah, it was really interesting because you were like, oh, I did Punisher. And you were like, oh, we can put a question in there about that. And I was like, no, we're going to talk about Punisher. Uh, he also did Saints Row 
as well. Yes, the Saints, Saints Row. Uh, yeah, because he was VP yeah. and GM of uh, Volition as well. And Saints yeah. Row, I got really deep on that series because, yeah, yeah, that was groundbreaking. It, it, if you're a fan of you know those early Xbox 360 days and uh, Saints Row, um, it's a really really interesting uh, interview, and it's quite funny because you just said it there about like you know going up against like the likes of Microprose and stuff. That seemed to be a big theme of his career, of the companies that he worked with, worked for, would go up against these huge companies like Rockstar and stuff like that with their games, and it was really interesting to kind of hear about the timelines of it. And well, that, you know, games aren't necessarily, you know, dupes of other games and stuff like that. And when, you know, the, you know, when they're kind of like the concept of them starts and stuff, I found that really interesting, especially with Saints Row and GTA. It was it was the changing of technologies as well as spotting the kind of gap. I think you're completely right with that. Saints Row was a game that came out when GTA was, you know, dominating the world and they found mm-hmm. a, a, something that was missing in GTA, which was the the kind of fun and yeah you know the the gangs and territories and stuff like that so that was great but also you know the changes uh with the cd-rom as well and uh there's stuff like silent hunter which was a, a fantastic game and um you know the the changes in technology as well going into into the 3d world as well with panzer 3d and uh he also worked on command and conquer a mm. renegade as well which was wow. another kind of game where it completely flipped the concept of command and conquer on its head um with that first person and third person mode as well so uh, it's an absolutely fascinating interview and i've wanted to have dan on the podcast for absolutely years so it's great to have him on yeah so he's going to be our special guest dan sermat coming up on the podcast in around half an hour from now but of course, first half of the show, that is when we uh, have a lot of natter about what's been happening in the world of retro from over the last week. And uh, this is quite a big headline that I've been seeing everywhere because um, this is something we actually did an episode about, episode 190 of this podcast when we had Randy Linden on the show, who was behind a product called Bleem back in the day, which I know you're a huge fan of that, weren't you, Ravi? I'm, I'm a collector of Bleem yes. items um, because this was a product that kind of got taken off the shelves. So it had a, a pretty quick life. And um, what Bleem was, was it was basically emulation, uh, but of a console that was out at the time, which was absolutely mad. It enabled PlayStation games to run on the Dreamcast and um, with a, a little bit of graphical upgrade as well. And, um, did some absolutely amazing stuff. It was it was down to fantastic coding, and they also, um, you know, had a PlayStation emulator that worked on the PC as well, and you could take advantage of your Voodoo card and <laughs> kind of have hardware acceler- acceleration in there, which is absolutely mad. But this looks like it's the Bleem name, but uh, in another form. And I personally thought Bleem got sued out of existence <laughs> that's well, why the, yeah. the the products are so rare well they didn't i mean sony had a problem with it obviously because i mean like you said you know the fact that the systems were on the market at the same time it'd be like now walking into a game shop and being able to pick up a an emulator that allowed you to play the last of us on an xbox wouldn't it Especially yes, and, I, and i think in the interview i recall randy telling us it was about the screenshots that mm. was the kind of thing that the whole case hinged on and um, it was using the PlayStation st- screenshots on the back that actually really got them in trouble. Yeah, well, uh, they did take it to court and Sony lost the case, um, basically saying that, you know, there was no copyright material distributed such as BIOS files and said the emulator didn't break the law. So um, it was still on the market for a bit, but then, uh, unfortunately, all of those costs of uh, going up against Sony in the courts. Yeah, and uh, Sega were uh, very happy to have them on board as well, yes. weren't they? They were like, yeah. Go well, uh, <laughs> Bleem went bust in 2001 after all the uh, legal costs of trying to go, go up against uh, Sony. Um, but it turns out the name is back now, um, and it's actually kind of been split in two, hasn't it? So the first um, service that it's going to be used on is a website called Bleem.net. Uh, and it's using exactly the same branding. Um, yes, same font. It, which is weird, because I don't think it's that much of a recognisable brand, mm. other than, you know, for for a few niche geeks. I don't think it, it's that big a name. I, I could be wrong, but yeah, I, I'm sure there's there's other brands like you know Polaroid, 
they came out. They were used on everything. Everybody knows Polaroid, but Bleem? Mm. Mm. Yeah, slightly obscure. And this is Pico Interactive, who actually owned this. Interestingly, they bought it back in 2018, but they haven't really done anything with the branding until now. So what are they going to be doing with this? And explain what Bleem.net is going to be. I'm not sure. It's just an empty site at the moment, but um, I think it's a nostalgia port, apparently, mm. um, which sounds a bit weird. <laughs> but um, they're saying that they've got lots of IPs and and they're going to start releasing stuff out on there. Yeah. So it, it doesn't say what Bleem.net will be, but as Dan said, it's kind of been split into two. So there's Bleem.net, which we're not too sure what that's going to be, but then listed separately as a separate company is Bleem, which is, but they're the same thing. They're using the same logo, both owned by Pico Interactive, but Bleem.net is going to be a website. And I have a theory on that once I say what what this other thing is. And then Bleem is a publishing company and they're publishing some upcoming retro games. So the port of a game called Rage of the Dragons, which was a Neo Geo game, which is being re-released on modern systems as well as also being behind the Steam versions, publishing-wise, of the Glover game that recently got done, the back end of last year, Super mm. Noah Arc 3D, and The Immortal. So it looks like they're using Pico Interactive using Bleem as like a publisher for retro games. Right. And then maybe Bleem.net, I think, might be like, I don't know, maybe it'll be like an emulation website or like something like that to, a way a place to play retro like games. gog or zoom platform something like that yeah that's yeah. what i think mm. that's what i think it will be but as ravi says at the moment it literally just says like a website that's like under construction and it says like come back soon <laughs> um, you know um they, they, they're saying that they might sell merch and and stuff like that as well but yeah i think that might have a little kind of a thing in the dreamcast community as well some people might want some of that um there was a bleem controller that was planned at one point oh, it was okay. never released which is like legendary you know if i i don't even know if there were a few prototypes released or, or there might be a few out there that are worth millions but um you it's know not one on uh, your bleem maybe, shelf then ravi is a no oh, oh prized <laughs> item prized item but um yeah i don't I only ever saw concept images of it, so I think that mm. would be something cool for them to kind of release. Um, I'm not sure about it being a publisher. Yeah, it seems miles away from the kind of innovation of the original, but also probably uh, a lot legally safer. Yeah, so uh, welcome back, Bleem, even if it is you know completely different to what the uh, the original service was. But if you want to check out more about that, there is a little uh, um, email box on the website that you can fill in if you want to get updates as and when that goes live so we'll put that in this week's show notes now i've never bought anything off um aliexpress before you often shop off that off, on there don't you ravi oh, you're a user of that site i use dh gate for football shirts but uh, right. we won't go into that i mean explain what aliexpress is then is it it's like a virtual kind of marketplace then yeah yeah, yeah, it's it's just kind of like your ebay but you can get a lot of wholesale stuff on there a lot of it's from china um different areas you you can usually get buy more of it and get it cheaper get it shipped in it will take a long time to arrive but they also sell stuff like knockoff consoles and uh there's all sorts on there basically we we're talking last week weren't we about those um modified sega saturns mm. that are on there that people are putting into kind of glass and the crick cases that kind of thing and taking the optical drives out so there's quite a big retro gaming marketplace on aliexpress from the looks of it um, although this one has been concerning quite a few people that apparently there are some fake playstation one games that are being sold on yeah. aliexpress the only thing is these are actually they reckon at first glance quite indistinguishable from the original black playstation one discs which before now if you uh, ever copied a, a playstation game generally they'd be on like a, a standard cdr so they're really easy to spot yeah, so generally, you know, these kind of like fake consoles and games and stuff, reproductions that are on there, you know, that you guys just mentioned, the Sega Saturn stuff, they kind of resemble what they're meant to be. You know, it'll be a Sega Mega Drive that kind of looks like a Sega Mega Drive and it might not even be called a Sega Mega Drive. You know, it'd be called the Mega Unit or something. Very, very, very obviously 
you know, not the original product. But the concern that some people are having is, as you've just mentioned, there seems to be, a, you know, rife with PS1 games, which are selling pretty cheap, but they're all high-end PlayStation 1 games, like your Breath of Fire games, um, a lot of like Sudokan and stuff like that. And they're like $20, mm. but they are going to the lengths of, you know, having them professionally printed you know like the artwork and everything like that so it looks really real but as you've just mentioned they're then printing them on are they, are they dipping it or they're printing it on the black discs which yeah, is, i don't know yeah. where you get black discs from so they must be making them yeah well, a, lot, a lot of these factories are based in china you know um yeah with counterfeits as well it is huge there it's the biggest country in the world that does it um i've even seen uh, counterfeit cars like entire cars done nice um, in, in china <laughs> so you know i i think the difference with these are like you said it's it's accuracy um yeah these are really indistinguishable and i can imagine as someone like you who resells games this is definitely a concern yeah i mean like dan said the the old copied ones from back in the day you know when you had a chipped ps1 you know, they were just written on a gold disc, you know, Spyro the Dragon. So obviously you see that kind of stuff everywhere. Um, And it, you know, this is very, very obvious. These are really, really good dupes. I would say me and my mates who I kind of go around with stuff can probably spot this stuff. But if it's something you're just getting into, or if like my dad who likes to go to the odd car boot and he'll ring me up and say, I've just seen some PlayStation games. Like he'd probably he'd have no idea he'd have no reason to believe they're not real at this level of quality. Like they're not just like photocopied like manuals or anything like that. Like they're they're going to great lengths to make these look completely official. I think I'd be able. It's funny because the thread of this like it's kind of fifty fifty. Like some people are saying like oh this is terrible it's going to ruin the market, but other people are saying you should be able to you should have a good eye for it if you are. Mm an avid ps1 collector and if you're not an avid ps1 collector and you want to play the likes of sudokan which is a 100 pound plus game or 200 dollar game in america and you want to play it on hardware then i guess that's a good way to play it if you don't want to necessarily like emulate it on your pc but you want to play it on playstation Although apparently, according to this thread I've read here, um, a lot of these don't actually work because they are they need a chipped PlayStation. I was about to get to that because I was going to say, but then I've read that some of them might not even work because you need a chipped yeah. PlayStation. And obviously, if you're just a casual, I want to play this game on an original PlayStation and I don't want to spend hundreds of dollars, hundreds of pounds, then you need a chipped PlayStation, which I can't imagine there's many, you know, makes uncles chipping playstations anymore <laughs> and you just burn your own disc if uh, you just wanted to play yeah. it you think uh, yeah it. exactly you can buy like i'm just looking at the moment on amazon 50 pack of black back cdrs right. oh okay 20 Not quid. Hard to get hold of um them. yeah and i i remember <laughs> going to precisely what you're on about which is car boot sales back in the days and they would have like ri- like even printed discs um uh, you know you get the the cheap guys doing it with the cut uh, with the paper cut out, and then that was glued onto the top of the disc. I remember that. But then you get printed discs, but they never get the color tones right, and you could you could never kind of um, you know they were using cheap ink or or whatever to do it, and the back was always like dark blue or something like that. But um, I can imagine now if they're just pumping these out of a factory, but um, I don't know how much money they're going to make from it but you know there's we've we've seen fake versions of, of retro consoles that people have made um you know there's there's counterfeit everything at the moment um it, it seems to be a huge huge industry yeah i mean the selling for you know looks like about 17 to 30 quid most of these so mm. they're obviously i mean there must be you know marking it up enough to earn profit on them obviously um but i think yeah if you if you were to take some of these discs to an independent gaming shop. I imagine, you know, somewhere like uh, Sore Thumb Gaming, they'd spot that these are fake straight yeah. away. But, um, you know, maybe if you tried to trade it in at CEX or something, they might not know what to look for. So I think that's a bit of a concern if they end up in places like, you know, CEX. Yeah, and, and that does happen. You know, mm. to be fair, I didn't even think of that. 
I do see on some of the CEX groups and stuff on Facebook, people saying like, oh, avoid this particular game. It's a, it's a fake one kind of thing. And mm. it's, you know, it's, it's always obviously expensive games. So yeah, that's generally cartridge based games, which I've seen, you know, be faked for years on eBay mm. and stuff like that. But generally they are just the cartridge, you know, with like a sticker on it. And for that, they tend to use real cartridges as well, but of like cheaper games. And then they put a, you know, a a fake board of a more expensive game and put a sticker on it kind of thing. And like you say, you know, and this isn't me being horrible or taking the mick or something, you know, you might get somebody working in CEX who isn't familiar with Super Nintendo games and accepts it. So yeah, yeah, the same thing could happen for sure with these as well. I didn't even think of that, to be honest. Um, but yeah. I guess... It's then, just keeping your wits about you, I guess. Yeah, it? it's just you as a buyer, as a collector, to be vigilant, I guess. Yeah. And again, it's that old adage, you know, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Mm. Um, if you're seeing a game that normally sells for £200, going for like 50 quid, then yeah, chances are it might not be uh, all that legit. So uh, yeah, I thought we'd mention that as, uh, you know, a lot of our audience are obviously game collectors. So if you want to read more about that, I'll link uh, the article in the show notes as well. Now, this next story is uh, quite heartwarming to read. You know, I've talked about my shameful past on the podcast before of, uh, you know, throwing a couple of Amiga 1200s in the bin like in my early 20s when I didn't think I'd use them anymore. And, you know, for those of us who have done that, you always kind of hope in the back of your mind that maybe something like this happened and they got rescued and got a whole new life because uh, this story is quite interesting and it's actually getting quite a lot of attention, surprisingly. Local councillors have been talking about it. It's even made uh, the front page on the BBC's website as well. This is that a rescued BBC micro that was apparently found at a tip has been rehomed in the National Video Game Museum in Sheffield. Yeah, this is uh, really interesting because, uh, you know, a bit of history used to hang around Ilco, Ilkeston when I was a kid. Um, Ilkeston Co-op Travel's going to get you there. That's a, a bit of nostalgia for uh, old adverts. For you. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, Matthew Bostock uh, basically spotted in his uh, recycling centre uh, in Ilkeston uh, a BBC Micro. And the thing about this is, the staff actually listened to him and rescued it, which is nuts. which is awesome because you know I've been there and I've like I've wanted to dive in the bin sometimes because there's been you know beautiful monitors that are getting crushed. I saw someone um, posting on Reddit that they'd seen an Amiga in there, um, you know that was getting crushed. Um, I think I just dive in and grab it. Yeah, well I don't. <laughs> you know you probably get massively shouted at by him i'm scared of yeah. the guys there sometimes when i drive up to the one in nottingham they're like put this here put that there go 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 and it's like yeah. a a military operation and um there's this whole tragic kind of um uh shipping container full of old crts and old i've been TVs. in that shipping container ever yet oh. it is heartbreaking when you walk in there i saw an old uh you know the bondi blue imax in there once um and i thought should i just pick that up and put it in the car but then there was like a queue of cars behind me yeah, and the bloke would yeah. be like, oh, I know yeah. about that one. You know, yeah, I just bought it in. <laughs> you, you'd ha- you're getting a fight with a guy. But I think this is great because this has actually been taken from the trash and uh, it was donated by the county council to the uh, Sheffield National Video Game Museum. So uh, it has a lease of new life. It was, it was oh. unwanted and now it's actually on display in a museum. It looks nice as well. Yeah, it looks in really good condition as well. Mm. Um, I think it was a case of jump someone like, let's throw this old crap out. And Which is surprising because you think, and obviously we you know, live and breathe this stuff, but you'd think there's, you know, in my mind, I kind of feel like because of all the articles you see, like, you know, rare copy of Super Mario Brothers sells for a million dollars, you know, that are all over like the Metro and the BBC and all that kind of thing. Um, I kind of assume that maybe these days people kind of knew the value of like old consoles and computers and you know kind of finding them in tips wasn't such a common thing anymore but maybe they don't even know what it is they might think it's an old typewriter or, or something yeah, I mean, like it, that it could have been know? maybe maybe a kid whose granddad passed away and they're cleaning the attic out and like you know they had, they'd have no idea what it was um, yeah yeah which makes sense but uh the fact that he was passing by and he goes that's a bbc micro and then they actually yeah. go all right mate and then they take it out i think uh 
big up the Ilkeston uh, scrap heap and recycling centre. Yeah. <laughs> How many of us are going to be driving there now to uh, see what they've got on our cigars? Sit there all day. Hey, yeah. mate, that's a ZX yeah. Spectrum. <laughs> Oi, mate, get that in. <laughs> I love as well that not only has this made uh, you know the BBC's website, but also uh, one of Derbyshire's county council councillors has even made a statement on it as well, saying uh, this is a great story and we're really grateful to Matthew for spotting this important computer. Yeah, yeah, it's a nice. huge computer, you know, uh, part of yeah. the BBC's literacy program, and uh, many people were educated on that, and it and it launched many careers. Yeah, so um, I imagine, I, I mean, it, a lot of these obviously were from schools, and it looks like there was, um, was like a patch on it that's kind of uh, a slightly lighter colour. If you look at it, it looks like maybe there was a you know a cheat sheet for a program kind oh, of stuck yeah. on there at some stage, maybe. Um, so I'm wondering if it was like maybe an old teacher. You know, had that kind of line around, which, you know, a lot of these places come from, I imagine. But yeah, very cool. And uh, yeah, they've got, you know, pictures of it in the display cabinet as well. Um, looks very well presented. So um, yeah, I've not been up to the um, video game museum since it moved to Sheffield. Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite good. It was, um, I went there when they first opened it and it was in Nottingham mm. as a video game arcade, a yeah. national video game arcade. And uh, now it's a museum. Um, it, it was quite a big empty space when I went because they first first arrived in there I'm not sure how they filled it out um but yeah it's it, it was worth a visit definitely and uh they had a melt meltdown as well which is a bar opposite there and we did a, a DJ chip tune gig with uh, Steph, uh Sheffield Steel City chip tune and uh, mm. had a guy in a halo suit dancing around as we played baseline on game boys and drum and nice. bass it was, it was very, <laughs> really cool yeah yeah so if you want to uh have a little day trip you're anyone near sheffield i'm actually working up there again soon so uh might have to pop in have a look at this place and see this bbc micro in flesh even though i've got one actually in this room but you know it's always nice to see him in museums isn't it so i'll link that in there this week's show notes now these look very cool you know those situations you probably all had it when you go around a friend's house and you want to play a game and you're like oh i haven't got a spare controller well, that might not be a problem anymore because you could have a controller with you at all times. This one hangs off your keyring. The Atom Collectible Keychain Controller. You know what? I clicked on this. Ravi sent this over earlier today. And I clicked on it and I was a bit like, oh. I instantly kind of wrote off the, uh, the shoulder buttons of it because they're next to each other rather than behind each other. But just to kind of like describe what it is, this is a very, very small, you know, gaming controller, which is compatible with the Switch, PC, Mac, mobile, tablet is what it's aimed for. But the the selling point for me was the Switch. So Mm -hmm. my brain started kind of instantly comparing it to the, you know, the Joy-Cons for the Switch. And the more I studied it, the more I was like, you know what? (laughs) I actually prefer this to the Switch controllers yeah, yeah. from the look of it because of, you've got all four face buttons on there. So you've got B, A, Y, and X. You've got an actual D-pad, whereas one of the Joy-Cons, you don't get a D-pad. Sort of don't get a D-pad from my, my mind's eye. You use the fire buttons, don't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you've got a, a minus and a plus, and then there's like a little home button in there as well. And I was like, you know what? I'm I'm assuming this is roughly about the same size as a Switch controller, maybe a little bit smaller, maybe not quite. It hangs up your key ring. It can't be that big. There's no it, sizes listed, though, is there? On there's the no website? sizes it's listed. Like a, no. Yeah. Only twenty pounds. I think that's I, like, I think that's a bargain. Um, and I was like, you know what? Yeah, I think I want one of these now. Like, so I wrote yeah. it off within thirty seconds. I was like, I want one. <laughs> <laughs> They do look nice, and I think, yeah, the fact that you've got them with you at all times, I think it's quite nice. And I, like I said, I was on holiday a couple of weeks ago. I brought my, uh, I brought a pro, pro controller mm-hmm. um, with my Switch, which, uh, you know, as much as I love that controller, it is a bit bulky to yeah. kind of use when Take you're playing broad. with the Switch on the plane. Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. So uh, this will be a nice little solution for that as well. And I reckon because um, it's Bluetooth as well, you're probably going to be able to connect it up to the um, mini consoles, um, which would be a mm-hmm. cool like little second controller or, or something like that for the mini consoles. Cause the designs of it is uh, quite nice as well. Um, they've got your translucent, uh, Apple style, uh, ones there for you, Dan. Yeah. Bring back see-through plastic. I was saying that recently. I'm glad to see they have. Could be a new trend. Um, also nice to have a controller that you could, you know, not that we play many mobile games, 
But I think if you've got like emulators on your phone, for example, and you know, you've got a quick half an hour free, these would be quite nice, wouldn't they? You know, a nicer way of playing games on your phone than using on screen. Yeah, I hate on, controls. Sc- on screen controls, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And if you can connect this up to the iPhone, that, that's wicked. Yeah, you can. Yeah. Yeah. yeah which um, is very nice. Good 10 thing hours for, of play as well. For, for sitting on the train and just, you know, doing those long journeys. Um, so, yeah, just nice to have, like you said, you know, for like 20 quid. You know, obviously we're getting into that time of year when you might be thinking of stocking fillers. Um, they come in loads of different colours as well. So that's called the Atom Collectible Keychain Controller. Right, one more story before we hop into our chat with uh, Dan Cermak, this week's special guest. And you're getting rather hyped about this, being our uh, resident Unreal Tournament fan, Ravi. Yeah, so this this is really cool, actually. Um, Epic Games, who originally made Unreal Tournament, have done a remake of Unreal Tournament 99's opening in Unreal Engine 5. If you've ever played Unreal Tournament, this was the intro that you would get every single time you open the game. Um, so it's a kind of soundtrack of my teenage years. And, uh, you know, it was it was on the original Unreal Engine, absolutely beautiful and kind of helped the foundation of the Unreal Engine. Seeing this updated in Unreal 5 is like a totally different world. And... Um, We've all been hoping for a reboot for a long time. You, you've not really played Unreal Tournament, have you, Dan? No, and um, actually, I did see a copy of it in a charity shop today. So no. I might have to uh, hop back and see that tomorrow. You, you're a fan of it, Joe. Did you play Unreal Tournament back in the day? I played it at a friend's house, the PS2 mm. version. But I don't think that was 99. That was a few years later, like Unreal Tournament 2 or 3. I'm, I'm not as familiar with it, anywhere near as familiar with it as a... Uh, Ravi is, but I've just watched this trailer earlier today, and I can definitely see why Ravi loves this game because it straight away gave me like you know Judge Jed kind of vibes, 2000 AD, which I know you're a big fan of as well. Yeah, it's it's basically you're in it. It's kind of a bit Running Man style. You're in a big yeah arena, and you've got to fight through uh, to kind of be the winner of this future death game, which is <laughs> pretty cool. But then they've got online modes. It had Catch of the Flag. Um, stuff like that um the original was a kind of peak for me the original unreal tournament of course unreal was a, a great game before that but it's not had remake so so there was a uh, one planned in 2014 and uh, that fell through which you know that was using unreal engine 4 but um unreal engine 5 just looks so insane and um epic games to release this they're actually releasing it because uh there's a new kind of thing coming on amazon studios which is um called the secret level anthology uh on december the 10th and it's like an animated series with stories set within these beloved worlds so i'm hoping for an unreal tournament remake uh seeing that kind of new intro uh just gives me goosebumps again um it's got a new announcer on it and stuff and uh you know we had lani manella on the um podcast well the voiceover artist yeah and she did all the voices of uh like unreal tournament so hearing some of the sound effects and voices from that was really good so if you want to check that episode out as well and if there's any ut fans out there please let us know and uh what what you'd love to see in a new kind of unreal tournament game i think as well this um amazon prime Series sounds interesting. Secret level. So this year, like I said, starts on uh, December 10th on uh, Amazon Prime Video. So it's going to be short little kind of 15-minute animated stories that are set in video game worlds. So we've got the Unreal Tournament one. There's also going to be one set in Pac-Man World. Yeah. There's going to be a Mega Man one as well. PlayStation World. There's basically going to be... Mod chips. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> different PlayStation characters, I guess. Spelunky is going to be one of them. It's quite interesting. Exodus, Dungeons and Dragons. So um, the idea of this sounds quite interesting, I think. A little kind of short 15-minute animations that are set in these uh, video game worlds. Yeah, yeah. So. And, I th- I, I, and I think this one particularly has uh, just stood out to me because it kind of gives me that tiny little bit of hope that we'll see uh, something new. And also it's a world that the, the law has not been explored that, that well. Yeah. Mm. Um, you know, looking at Halo and stuff, there's so much stuff about that. Um, it would be good to see some Unreal Tournament stuff. 
Of course, you want to get a glimpse of that, that little teaser for the new Amazon Prime series. I'll link that and, of course, all the rest of the stories. You don't have to Google around. I'll save you the job. I put them in the show notes on your podcast app, or you can click directly through from our website at theretrohour.com. Now, a little reminder that um, we do hugely appreciate your support. Many ways you can support this podcast, feel like what we do. You know, we did mention uh, last week, those little reviews that you do on uh, podcast apps like Spotify and Apple Podcasts with this little five-star review on there. A couple of nice words. Helps us get in front of new people. Hugely appreciated. One way that you can support the podcast. Another way is to uh, join our wonderful patrons community. Now, of course, our patron is definitely the uh, the lifeblood of this podcast. It allows us to basically just keep the show going, keep the lights on, you know, pays for stuff like our hosting costs and, you know, for the website and audio, all that kind of thing. Anything we need. It's nice to know that we've got the little pot there uh, supported by our wonderful patrons. And, of course, we give back as well. In the next couple of days, our gold members and above are going to get a, a brand new episode of the Retro Hour after hours which we've just recorded this one was an interesting one wasn't it yeah and we couldn't believe we hadn't done this one as well yes we did controllers so we did a bit of a mix our three favorite controllers and the two kind of like our most hated controllers and uh it was a caused some arguments which caused some arguments (laughs) mainly between me and dan i think yes we, we might still be hating on each other a little bit um, yeah, probably the most heated the we ever got, actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> we went in the same room. Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, really, really interesting lists. You know, if you like kind of like out there controllers and not the kind of like the normal thing you would think of, uh, there was a definitely a bit of that. And then there was a definitely a bit of like just kind of mainstream, the ones we're all familiar with. Um, mm. So it wasn't kind of like crazy stuff you would have never have heard of. Um, and not all nice things to say about the ones that we all use. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we even had nice things to say about some of the bad ones, didn't we, Dan? Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, really, really fun one. So if you do join a uh, patron, as gold member or above, like we say, we don't like to just take, take, take. We do try to give something back to the people who support us because we do really appreciate it. So you will get that episode, which is coming out any day now, along with about another 40 episodes. 45. The, 45 episodes of the yeah. After Hours uh on there as well as you know the show ad free um also we do give two extra bonus stories every week now as well as well as the hangout which we do at the end of every single month which you know as you all know i'm sure uh we absolutely love don't we yeah so um all of that if you join the wonderful retro hour patrons community all the details to join us right now or on our website at the now, before we hop into this week's special guest, Dan Sermat, talking about strategic simulations and lots more as well. He's coming up in just a minute. Of course, at this time of year is when, uh, you know, the weather's getting a bit worse. Like I said, storms here at the moment. It won't be long till it starts to get dark at like three o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, obviously the first of kind of the, uh, the big seasonal things is coming up at the end of this month. Halloween mm. in a couple of you weeks. You guys time, love which, uh, it, though. <laughs> Spooky <laughs> season. I watched Hocus Pocus. Joe and I are big kids, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about our sponsor, Express VPN. Because obviously, around this time of year, it's when we want to get the horror films on, isn't it? You know, as we uh, warm up for ha- Halloween, and um, obviously with all the different streaming services out there, if you want to have a bit of a Halloween movie marathon, it can get expensive fast. But mm-hmm. not if you're using our sponsor. Express VPN. Now, if you haven't used them before, I mean, it basically pays for itself because it lets you change your online location and you can trick services like Netflix into showing you literally thousands of movies and TV shows that aren't normally available in your country because there are hundreds of different Netflix libraries mm-hmm. in different parts of the world. So, all you do is you install Express VPN that works on. Uh, Pretty much all your devices, you know, install it on your uh, your smartphone, on your smart TV, on your computer, laptop, your tablets. Works on up to eight devices at the same time. Literally, click of a button, change your location, and then it unlocks a load of other content. For example, I know you've been uh, scouring around to find some of your favourite horror films in preparation for <laughs> Halloween, Joe. Absolutely. Well, if you want to, uh, I've, I've covered a few kind of horror angles here. So if you want to watch some uh, mindless schlock action horror and you know you want to keep it video games the entire resident evil uh films so the paul ws anderson ones aren't available on the uk netflix which blows my mind you change it to turkey or japan you get all seven of them 
which uh, I thought was quite interesting. Available in nice. lots of other countries, but they seem to be the two consistent uh, countries if you want to watch those films. If you fancy something a little bit more lighthearted, a little bit more comedy, uh, like our Ravi, who's not a big fan of horror, horror films, but if you want to watch an absolute hilarious classic, switch it over to Canada. You can watch Scary Movie 1 and 2. Uh, they're, they're, they're my kind love. of movies. Yeah, yeah I <laughs> love them growing up, to be fair. Um, Scary Movie 3 on there as well. You know, I quite like Scary Movie 3. Maybe mm. it fell off a little bit after that. But yeah, stick it on over to Canada. You can watch the Scary Movie films. Or if you fancy yourself a little bit more of a horror film connoisseur and you want to watch a classic, change it to Germany and you can check out the original Evil Dead or even the 2015 Evil Dead or even Evil Dead Rise if you switch over to Canada again. Now, I did uh, like the one. original Evil Dead. I thought that was a good one. Good choice, there Joe. There we go. There we go. They were my choices is- and my go-to films that I'm going to be watching over the next couple of weeks. And you can do the same with ExpressVPN. It doesn't just work with Netflix as well. You know, it can be a Disney Plus, Paramount, mm. BBC iPlayer, even YouTube. You know, there are some region-specific videos just on YouTube. And ExpressVPN also gives you strong encryption to protect you from real-life monsters like hackers and data thieves. And uh, obviously protects your privacy from uh, creepy stalkers and all the spooky creatures that lurk out there on the internet. So uh, ExpressVPN, it's the VPN service that we use really fast as well you know we can all test to that no buffering no lag you know we use it all the time we often forget it's even on don't we Ravi so it's um, absolutely worth getting so if you want to get your money's worth of these streaming services that we all pay for head to this link actually and we'll give you three months of ExpressVPN for free on top of a one year plan and let them know that we sent you so it really helps out the podcast expressvpn.com slash retro so if you ever thought of giving a VPN a try give it a go use our link get three months free expressvpn.com slash retro and a big thank you to our friends at ExpressVPN for their continued support right well thank you for checking out the news this week more next Friday and that next our special guest going inside the world of strategic simulation Centro lots more as well Dan Sermak is next on the Retro Hour podcast You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast, and we're here today with Dan Zermak. And Dan was the VP of Strategic Simulations Inc. He's also done some executive production at Westwood Studios, and he was a VP and GM of Volition as well. So it's absolutely fantastic to have him on. We've got a, a lot of history there, you know, going from some early C64 titles to uh, some of the most modern consoles out there as well. Um, how are you doing, Dan? I'm oh, doing very well. Very well. Yes. All right. So it's great to have you on the show. So uh, when we have guests on the show, we always ask, what was your first gaming experience or your first kind of gaming memory that stood out to you? Electronically, it would be Pong. I bought mm. one of the original like series Pongs and played it electronically. Uh, board games, I go back to when I was under 10, uh, 8 or 9. I found a, believe it or not, I found a, a war game in my dad's closet was Gettysburg. And I started playing those kind of games that early. So I was, I've always been kind of leaning towards strategy and difficult games because I've been gaming on war games forever. You're kind of a collector and a, a promoter of um, board games as well. And uh, I uh, have quite a few. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've seen some articles online of uh, uh, some of your collection. I, uh, I have an antique collection of uh, old war games, basically, back to 1895. Yeah. Wow. wow. And uh, you mentioned the Pong machine there. What was your first kind of machine for computing and stuff? Because of you were a self-taught programmer as well, weren't you? Yes. Yeah. I, and uh, I was at 77, 78, Apple II came out. And I was not impressed with the graphics. I didn't really like them. I didn't like the green screen. So I was kind of waiting. And then I think 79, I think the Atari 800 came out. And I went, oh, man, that's that's it. And I bought one of those. I think it had... 24k of ram i spent an extra i don't know a thousand dollars on another 8k or 16k or something like that it was ridiculous mm-hmm. and it i mean it had a cassette deck <laughs> that's how old it is and so yeah it was uh um i think 24k ram i of course got it up to 48k finally and more and i taught myself to program assembly language was that yeah. from like some some manuals or, or did you yeah, have any magazines of choice as well a- there was a fellow back then, and he's still he's still around. He wrote one of the first uh, books on game design. His name's Chris Crawford, and he wrote a game called Eastern Front for the or East Front for the um, 
Atari 800. And he, then he published and sold the, um, the code base for it. Of how, this is how I wrote it. And he did a book called D-Ray Atari, which told you all about the insides of the Atari. And between those two things, it, like, oh, it, it, it got me over the hump of trying to use all the manuals that you would find out there, 6502 this and that. And uh, it, it really helped me to understand how to program. So that's what started me off. It's yeah. uh, great that you mentioned Chris Crawford because we've had him on the on the well, podcast all, as well. And uh, Brilliant fella, brilliant oh, fella. Oh, yeah, that, that connection with board games, Avalon Hill and... Um, oh, yes you know, military games as well. And yes, kind of creating early strategy games. He's, he's yes. really the man for that, isn't he? Oh, he was, he was just amazing. And what he was able to do um, with a cartridge, a 48 K cartridge and how he did things with memory and all of that was just eye opening for me. Really amazing. And uh, what were some of your early experiments with the, uh, the Atari there? That's funny. <laughs> you asked the first thing I wrote was a, uh, an arcade game, and it was called The Gardens of Epsilon India. I actually um, sent it in. I, I got denied. Basically, the idea was you would, you would land, you crash land on a, on a planet, and your rocket's all torn apart, and you have to find the parts throughout this planet. So you run mm-hmm. from these little gardens, from one garden to the next, and you have to get there before night falls because th- there's a sun that goes up and goes across the sky and goes down. First time that was ever done. <laughs> but I think they used that in a later game. But they... Um, but I, I, you had to get, a, you had to shoot the monsters and stuff. But if you didn't make it to the garden by nightfall, you died. And so it was like collecting the pieces and then rebuilding your your ship. But uh, yeah, that got turned down. So then I started thinking about some of the tools that, some of the things that the system could use. And I taught myself to do um, full screen scrolling and using the AI and the vertical blank and all that sort of stuff. And I wrote an educational product, which was the history of Europe. And you took one disc, you stick it in there, and it would tell you the story of, say, Roman Empire. And then you could put mm-hmm. in um, a different one, and it might talk about Nazi Germany. And so it was like an educational thing, but it wasn't interactive, so I didn't do anything with it. But those two things taught me um, all the tools I needed to do to make the game I wanted to make, which was called Colonial Conquest in the end when it published. And that was like a, a super risk, um, six-player take over the world game in the 1880s. And the reason I went to 1880s was because it didn't have airplanes. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't have to program them. <laughs> yeah, there were ships and, and uh, you, you know, spying and fortifications. And it was hot seat, six player. It was like the second grand strategy game published on PC. And I got a game of the year from one magazine for it. It was oh, nice. really, really liked. I, th- I thought it was, uh, I did well with it. I mean, back then there were, there weren't, that wasn't a very big audience. And so. Yeah, I was pretty happy with that game, though. It was based off a board game I did. Did you have any, like, kind of self-publishing uh, attempts uh, before that? Or, no, or distribution? No, you went straight to the uh, publisher? Straight that to was, SSI. Uh, straight yeah. to SSI. I, I actually did my research, and I said, this is the one company that will publish my game. And I sent it in, and, and most people would send, you know, to all kinds of publishers. I just targeted SSI. And they sent me back and said, yeah, we'd like to publish it. Just have to make a few minor changes. <laughs> it took me six months for their minor changes. It only took me about six months to do the game and then it took me another six months to finish it. So, uh, yeah, that was quite a long haul. And But I got all of it done. And by 1985, we shipped the game, yeah. SSI seemed like an obvious choice with being a huge yes. <laughs> bo- board game fan. Um, yeah. When did it kind of move to doing like, you know, self-published titles to actually, you know, getting like work there and, and becoming a regular. And what was the kind of culture like back then? And at, well, I wasn't at, I was an indie. So I was an indie for some from 83 to 1989. I joined SSI in 89. I had actually two games that I published before I joined them. I joined in 89. And at that point, they had already gotten the um, AD&D license, which is was a big, that changed everything for SSI really got us over into the big big leagues really and they just shipped to pool of radiance and i think 88 89 right around there so i joined right after that and by then we were our, you know we were doing our own we had our own publishing wing i'm um, manufacturing wing as, as and a development um section of the company so um it was uh it was about that time really that that i joined and i saw really a, an established company so and at this point you were on the C64. What challenges was there making strategy games for the C64? When I was doing it, C64s 
actually pretty much the same as the um, Atari. You just had to figure out. They're both 6502. For us, for me, it was pretty easy. Um, okay. For If you were talking about SSI itself, um, it was the same thing. Most of the people uh, that worked on that had either um, a little engine that they'd built or a little tool set. Everybody was indie. You know, it's funny nowadays, it's like everybody's trained up and all these skill sets and everything. Back then, everybody was either using compiled basic or or had to go to something like assembly language. And everybody was indie. And it was just uh, kind of like figuring out the system. And you figured out the, the Commodore and the Atari. They were very much the same. Then the PC came along and all these things. Um, yeah, they all had to just handle differently as all. And it was just a different platform. We did a lot of porting at SSI. I was in charge of external development and then I'd had to control all the porting of products. So we'd make a game and then we'd have to get somebody to try to do it on a different platforms. Um, that happened quite a bit. Was there a lot of like shared documentation and like internal tips and kind of tricks that oh, sure. know, well, people were trying? Yeah. In terms of programming, not really. I, I think that um, most of what we did, we'd, we'd read about something somewhere. Um, there was uh, that sort of thing. It was it's funny, at least I was pretty insular. I didn't I didn't have a lot of people to talk to about why don't you try this trick or that trick. I did get some hints on terms of the 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 art in my game. Beyond that, it was mostly just, you know, you just kind of bang through it and and uh, hope you find documentation that will support certain aspects. And that's what you most of the time we looked for was, you know, who wrote what about the Commodore, who wrote what about the Atari. And that sort of thing. I never went to the PC at that point in time. Um, so I didn't do any programming or work on it. All the, like the Atari, um, the ST, someone ported my game to that. So a lot of what my folks was just the 8-bit, yeah. And uh, at the time, which publishers did you see as rivals? And did you kind of look at what those rivals were doing and, you know, take anything from that and try oh, and do things sure. differently? Very competitive. I, Microprose was probably our biggest rival in our minds. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Maybe not Microsoft yeah, yeah. was in mine. But EA, it's funny, EA had a part of SSI, like 25% or some of it. Um, they had some portion of investment in it. At the same time, they were a rival because, you know, it's like you kind of, anybody who did role-playing, we were very interested in what they were doing. But Microprose did war games like we did, and simulations like we did. So we were really interested in what they were thinking. They did strategy games. There was the one, gosh, what's the one game? Of, it was called, they kind of said Civilization in Space. And we competed with them to get that and they got it and we didn't. It was so disappointing. So yeah, there was, that kind of thing happened. We made mistakes. Like I think um, we actually looked at SimCity as a submission and said no, <laughs> things like that. But our biggest competitor, I think was probably in our minds was Microprose, but just because they were very similar to what we were doing. Were there many like requirements from EA? Oh, yeah, just, no, they completely stayed out of our business. Okay. That was very nice of them. Yeah. They didn't, they didn't bother us too much at all. But at the same time, you know, as I said that they had cut this new path, almost treating development like a recording studio and right. You had the, like a record labor. They had um their advertisements looked like every, the developers were almost like um, rock stars, you know, it was really fun. Yeah. It was really cool. That, that was really cutting edge and it was awesome to be seeing that. But yeah, it's, um, there were so many people that you, it's funny, we all played everybody else's games. It was so much fun to do this at the time because there were so many great games out there. Everybody was trying something different. Like I said, everybody was indie and you weren't really focused on one genre versus another. Everyone was just trying new things. And uh, so we were playing everything. And, <laughs> and SSI was grounded in games. I mean, we, we role played after work. We played miniatures. We did war games we did i mean we spent so much time playing games uh it was crazy and yet you're kind of right about the difference in packaging as well ssi was very like fantasy dungeons and dragons old school and very old yeah, school it was totally different yeah but you knew yeah, what you got had, with the old school my, the initial um ssi games were in these giant like eight and a half by 11 boxes my my game was shipped in one of those and then we shrunk it down because I guess it was cheaper. Yeah. And then EA's over in these little, like almost record album situations. It was great the way that it was different. Yeah. Everybody kind of, most people did what we did. EA was the special group that did it a little different. Well, how did uh, play testing work then? I know you did some play testing on other titles as well. Well, I actually was in charge of play test when I first came in. I was um, response, I was the manager, the external development manager, and I was also in charge of QA. So I had to set up, I had a team of probably 10 to 15 people. 
and we had, you know, we set up test plans and, and we did the whole thing very, it was pretty, um, we got pretty organized with it. It was very important. That part of it, we'd spend a lot of time, uh, going through the testing cycle and everything. Yeah. So it was pretty, it, it's, it's changed some, and then it's got more like you can have test suites and, you know, there can be a QA, uh, QA engineers in there and all that sort of thing, but it's, you know, you still have to pound through the, the product and, uh, um, so I remember some guys in the old, in our games, in the SSI um, gold box games, the D and D games, they were laid out as, and when you get into a tactical battle into these squares, it was just like a giant, a gigantic chessboard, like, you know, a hundred by a hundred or whatever. And someone had mm-hmm. to go from every, every square in all four directions to make sure that there wasn't a, a block of some kind. That's what one person did all day long, you know, just uh, every day. <laughs> <laughs> Poor guy. Just, just walking <laughs> along in a game. <laughs> yeah, I don't think he ever finished a game. I don't think he ever finished one, but he did a lot of that. That's funny. Well, interesting, you you know, leading on from the playtesting. Um, what were the differences at SSI when creating games for consoles compared to the computers? Well, it's funny because most of what we did was computer, right? So you're looking at mm. like the Atari. The, we sent most of our stuff off to somebody else, like in Europe, to do the versions for um, other other um, platforms that weren't PC driven. So we didn't actually have the expertise internally that much for that. And uh, most of it was done as an outsource. Yeah, because like, um, you know, you mentioned SimCity as well. I remember seeing the SimCity uh, version on, on the NAS was like vastly. Yeah. Different. I can't imagine. Um, uh, the I can't imagine yeah. making that. Oh my gosh! Some of, I mean, some of these things took forever to build um, externally because they had to figure out how to do the memory and all these issues that were related to that. Everything was so memory driven when you started to shrink it down, and these people had to get really creative. Um, it was pretty impressive what the, what you'd see sometimes. Well, and you, then there were some times where we just couldn't do it. We just couldn't. We couldn't get it ported over. Well, you mentioned that you were. Um porting to multiple systems as well there was the amiga apple II, yep. c64 and dos out at the oh, time yes. yep. what, what were the kind of differences and uh challenges you know having to make a higher-end version or, and uh, well a, a, a higher-end version. version was mostly graphical someone had to go in there and do something different with the graphics and up, upscale them and because it you know you think about what an, a, a little 8-bit artwork looks like versus those 16-bit machines the um the st and the amiga were beautiful compared to what we were doing. And so that takes, uh, um, for us, you know, when you go downward, like at Volition and all these other places, you can have an upscaled version and shrink it, right? But it's harder to go up. And so it costs, it's like a lot more work in the art side more than anything else. There's, there is the issue of, um, you know, just, I think, well, those are the biggest issues. The audio is another one though, because, you know, think about 8-bit audio versus the 16-bit audio. And how do you, uh, how do you take advantage of that on something that you're, you're upporting it's it's a little bit different silent hunter was a wicked title with a lot of historic references in there how did changing technology help with the added extra multimedia features oh silent hunter oh yeah silent hunter was amazing um, it, it was like a changing point wasn't it you know uh, it was two guys <laughs> two guys made that game i don't know how they did it in some ways it was uh the expertise, the program, there was a programmer and an artist, and that was it. And they did all the design work and everything. It was a tough haul for them, though. They they had some um, real extra pressures on them. It was a hard crunch for them on the second game. The first one was just fabulous in terms of the whole process. We really, uh, I think that was a, a big change in, in how things looked and, and some of the simulation stuff that we were working on. That was one of the best we did. Yeah, I really, uh, it was tough working with them, though, because they were pretty quiet and insular and so you didn't get a lot of information about what was going on in the team the two of them um and then we found out later on that yeah they had some real stress and pressure that we didn't even know about what was it interesting going into that more kind of 3d simulation area and you know kind of into into micro prose territory as well a bit uh moving from the kind of traditional fantasy stuff yeah, it was. You have to understand that we started SSI was like started with Computer Bismarck, and it was a war game company. And so we had all these tank battle games. And when everyone went 3D, it's like, oh, look what we can do. This concept. It wasn't like we we're thinking, oh, this is going to be different. It was just another way of presenting the game that um, seemed to be interesting to us. Like we did a, a fair number of tank simulations and and uh, like SU 
you know, 27, I guess the flight sims and the, the, um, the Panzer games as well. Oh, the Panzer, there, which, yeah, we did yeah. so many different iterations of it because it just seemed like, oh, here's a different way to, to present the game. When we did the, the board games, um, I mean, the board game style games, the, the, you know, top down kind of, uh, almost like a, like I said, a board game, we get people sending in notes saying, you know, you've got the muzzle velocity of your tank wrong. I mean, it's like, really? And <laughs> <laughs> it's like it, it was more visceral uh, the thought process was like we we put them in a tank and we can do something different here and and the same thing with uh like the silent hunter i mean it was just going 3d and being able to to actually have a platform like uh, the pcs and things that had gotten to the point of the ibms now we could we could actually generate enough memory and speed and things to do these that that was amazing i mean we loved that we, we thought it was great but they're they're you know obviously a lot more work uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's a ton of, of thought process and, and, um, programming effort. That's a different kind. And, and then you have to think about the UI and UX, which is a different presentation to a user than say a top-down board game. So there was a whole, a mind shift of how we look at the game. And I don't think we got good at, at UI UX <laughs> during that whole period. I mean, I look at it now and I think back and go, Wow. It's it's amazing what we put out and without really thinking about UX and user experience at all, we just kind of put out what we thought was good, kind of what we call what I call nowadays Zen Zen design. You know, it it, yeah. it, feel, it feels good. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, yeah. I was wondering as well because pacing was a a huge oh, yeah. kind of thing at the time. You know, you had the rise of real time strategy, but also the pacing changed completely in games. You know, when they were turn based before. Um, going yep. into that into that world yep. of you know more action and more speed what was that like well yeah that's see that's the thing i i always found there was a, there's multiple reasons that some people prefer the speed you know there that's a skill right you develop that skill and when you're good at it you can you can really show it but the issue with it and that 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 then you know creates a perfect kind of situation for multiplayer which is where you start talking about social and all kinds of different aspects to gaming that we didn't have so much back then. If you hot seat with somebody, that's different. So you start playing with someone online because it's real time and boy, the, the skills can really show, but then you have a dependency on a decent internet connection and all these other things that kind of factor into whether or not you you're playing well or not. And so all these same kinds of things are all considerations that again, you know, it's like, it's more things you have to deal with and think about that creates a bigger product cycle a longer product cycle and more expertise i mean it was a heck of a lot i think about it, right i i wrote two games in in 60 6502 assembly language i didn't even consider writing uh, more games after i got after the pc came out and i started thinking yeah. about what am i going to have to learn here mm. to, to put it out on an ibm you know pc it's this going to change all kinds of efforts and then i gotta i gotta upscale this thinking about sound and and video i mean and yeah even video and and um and art all that's got to be upscaled. So there's so much more to think about when you think about as each platform grew, it just got more and more difficult to bigger, bigger projects got bigger. I mean, I think about it like, I think we had 20 people on the Pool of Radiance team. That was huge. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't think, I don't think our teams, I mean, our products cost that much, relatively speaking. But I think 19, I think it was early 90s before the first million dollar project was ever built. Um, mm -hmm. I think that was an Ultima, I think that was an Ultima game was like a million dollars. We thought they were nuts. They spent a million dollars on a game. I remember that. It was crazy. Uh, so it's like, and nowadays, you know, you think about 250 million, it's not a not a hard thing to think about in terms of making a game. So, <laughs> well, GTA 6. <laughs> yeah, I don't, even, I don't even, my brain can't wrap around that one. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're saying it's a billion now or something like that, which yeah. is just mental, like you say. One to two, yeah, that's what I've heard, one to yeah, two. one to two billion. So uh, what were some of your, I was wondering, what were some of your favorite games that you worked on at uh, SSI? Gosh, there were so many. The Panzer General stuff I loved. I thought that was great. There was one called Sword of Aragon. That was a blast. It was terrible. I mean, the programming was in basic, and but the world itself and the fan, there was a combination of kind of a role play aspect to this combat, and it was really fun. Um, I liked Eye of Beholder. See, when I was producing um, and doing the external stuff and we we're looking for porting people we spent a lot of time porting with Westwood and mm -hmm. Westwood that's how they started as a porting house 
And then we said, well, why don't you try something? They did Hills Fire for us and they did these other games. And then I have the Beholder, which was for me, it was a blast because it was a a, a different form of uh, the D&D game. It was like, you know, first person. And that was a great kind game. Kind of dungeon crawler, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. yeah. I love Silent Hunter was one of my favorites, like you said. I really enjoyed that. Believe it or not, there was one um, space game that we did. Uh, Renegade. No, not Renegade. Uh, Renegade Legion was interesting. It was a good game. All those licenses that we had, it was interesting to do those. We had the, um, I liked Fantasy General. That was really mm-hmm. fun. It was different. It was hard, though. A little too hard, probably. We had the the Warhammer 40K license which was oh, yeah. great. Yeah, we had that at the same time as we had the AD&D. That was a, we did some some fun games with that as well. So it's, I kind of look at it more like licenses. We were, because when I first started there, as it was a privately owned company, you had to ship product. If you didn't ship product, people didn't get paid. Mm-hmm. So we were, you know, we would be bringing in new product constantly and shipping it out. And um, it was crazy uh, how much we would ship in the course of a year that came out of, our group. And then once a year, we'd have that big game that came out of the internal group. That was our big hit. You know, that drove a ton of revenue, but it only happened once a year. So it, it made us um, really cognizant of, you know, making sure that we got a game that we could finish, you know, and get it done and get it out. We did uh, uh, Neverwinter Nights yes, on, AOL, yeah. on AOL. On AOL, this is not the Neverwinter Nights of Bioware. This was a, the very early AD&D um, gold box version and it was, I think, the first graphical MMO I would produce that one. And that was crazy. I, I mean, we didn't, it was nuts to try to make that work. And it was, uh, it lasted for a long time. It was pretty fun, but it got really kind of twisted. <laughs> I think the world got a little bit nutty and the people in it were, the people, the players were doing some crazy stuff. <laughs> yeah, we've um, had Richard Garriott on and we've, you know, heard some, some of the tales of, uh, you know, the, the online world back then and. Oh how, yeah! How crazy some of these worlds got. Um, I'm amazed we got it done. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, kind of being VP, you must have had some good contacts then, and especially with a good relationship with Westwood Studios, who you ended up oh, yeah. kind of working with. And also, there they had the real time strategy, really locked down with, um, you know, Dune, of course, and then going into the, the Command yes. and Conquer series. What yes. What did you think of that? Because I know you're a big military fan as well. They, when they did it, I mean, it blew my mind that they actually pulled off uh, uh, creating a brand new genre. I mean, that's the, that mentality is just like, the, you know, nothing new under the sun in games, but they did something different. And that that was amazing to see. Um, the gameplay was great. I, I really enjoyed playing it. Like I said, I'm a turn-based guy, though. I mean, I, I've been a Civ fan from the beginning. It's probably my favorite game. I should say that, really. Yeah, I, I love have, Civ. I think I colonization as well is one yeah. of my favorite. Yeah. yeah. I think I have on Civ five, I have uh, 12,000 hours wow, up, on, wow. up on steam. It says 12,000. I'm like, really? <laughs> 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 I, I played that a lot. Um, so that was probably my favorite, but I, what they did, it just changed everything. And all of a sudden you had all these products coming in that were real time and this whole different mentality about how to make a game. And um, it was like everyone driving to get that big hit. Right. Let's all let's see if we can do what Command and Conquer did. Um, Dune didn't didn't hit like Command and Conquer did. Command and Conquer changed, even though Dune was the first one. Command and Conquer was the one that everyone went, "Wow, this is kind of jaw Conquer. hit the floor game, wasn't it?" Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was just. I mean, plus you put in the you know the like Red Alert, probably the best in the, in the series for me. I loved Red Alert series um, with the with the story, the the mm. B movies, and the whole thing. That was just brilliant. And so those things, I mean, that those guys were great. Um, they had a porting mentality, though. It was interesting to visit them. Westwood, when you went there, they were very secretive. You, you know, you were you walked down a hallway and you went left, and that was it. You know, you went into the room because they were working on three, four, or five projects at the same time, and you couldn't see what else they were doing. When they, when I was working with them as porters, and uh, they kind of kept that culture. It was a little bit weird to work with them. I love the guys. I mean, Louis Castle and Red are, are amazing. They, yeah, yeah, we've had uh, Louis on the podcast as yeah, well. Yeah, Louis's great. Oh, Louis's great. He's just the nicest guy in the world. I really appreciated him. But it was an interesting culture to be in. And not what I was used to at, at SSI. SSI was just like, you know, everybody's all running around like crazy working together. And and there it was very uh, compartmentalized on purpose because that's the way they had started. And they kind of kept that culture. So I think that was important. 
I think when a studio builds a culture, you have to kind of live that culture. But mm. um, that's one thing that EA was not kind of <laughs> to studios about. They kind of pushed the culture down on them. And that uh, I was there when that was happening. It was interesting. So speaking of Command & Conquer, did working on Command & Conquer Renegade help you rethink how strategy games could work? You know, obviously it had a big change in direction with the series to third person at that point. Yeah, that that's an, such an interesting game because what happened is SSI got sold to um, Software Toolworks, who changed their names to Mindscape, and Mindscape then got built, bought by Pearson and TLC, and TLC mm, they did some kind of I would I wasn't really impressed with some of their methodologies, like they flooded the market with edutainment, and then told the uh, Mattel that hey look we're doing great, and they weren't. Um, and Mattel bought them and paid a lot of money for something that wasn't worth that much. And so they basically shut us down. And when I shut down, I went to GDC and I'm going, oh, you know, I got to find something else to do. And there, um, talked to, to Lou there, I think, um, he said, come on over. We got this product that we've been working on. You, you know, you come over and finish it. And I said, sure, that sounds great. Um, I didn't really look around anywhere. I just talked to them. I, I enjoyed working with them so much. I went on over. And when I got there, unfortunately, Renegade was um, was a third person action game. The idea was great, I thought, but it had been worked on for four. Or I think uh, there were four producers before me, and had been in process for years. I think four years. Each one had had a year to work on it, and it was just when I got there, there was just really nothing there. So the focus couldn't be on let's do something really marvelous and interesting. Let's the had the focus had to be let's get it done. They were they wanted it done in like I think I joined in like March, right after maybe um, April, and they wanted it in September, and it was going to be another year, September and another year, and they were like, oh no, and I said that's just the way it is. The morale was that wasn't there. There just wasn't much to the product, to tell you the truth. And uh, we spent got the team up, and the team got pretty solid, and we did. I thought um, we screwed up on on our uh, multiplayer, and that we weren't tracking it, and then we lost our TD. Our technical director and uh, and there wasn't enough work done on it, so we had to shift it a quarter and ship it uh, a quarter later than we wanted. That cost us because we up, went up against uh, Wolfenstein when it when it was redone. That was just yeah, good luck there. Yeah. And so, <laughs> but that we had this idea for the second one. If we had done Renegade Two, it was literally like playing. A CNC from the from uh, the third person. You had a little controller on your hand, and you could order out tanks, and it and the team was all excited. And we 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 got there with that, but EA wasn't interested, unfortunately. I find it always interesting because there was always that idea of you know you're playing something like SimCity, you're playing SimCopter, and they always had that little novelty that you could zoom in. Like uh, I remember on yep. uh, Theme Park as well, you know, you could zoom in and try the rides, and that that. I guess that was the idea with Renegade. You know, you, people always wanted to zoom in and become the soldier inside That's exactly the CNC right. world. Yeah, yeah. For me, what I learned from from the whole thing was a lot of design elements because EA had some great designers on staff at the time. They were working with some high end folks, and they had written up these little documents about their design thought processes, and it was really helpful. And then there's the just the production process that the uh, that um, EA had was of a higher level. So I learned a lot from that and took that to volition. Um, but yeah, it was uh, a learning experience because every day I was talking to somebody at EA um, at the, in, and I'm talking at the highest level of, of their development side. It was a vice president every day. And, it, you know, because there was so much push to get the game done. And uh, uh, that was, that was very interesting. Bing Gordon would come over and we'd ride to the airport and talk about different things. It was just like, wow. There was so much push and pressure on that product. It was unfortunate. Um, I, I wish I'd gotten there a year earlier because I think that uh, it was uh, there was some really bright design minds there, and I would have liked to have gotten a chance to spend more time um, developing out the product in terms of the design. I, I was wondering then, how, how did kind of Volition start, and how did you get involved, and uh, what was the process with that, and also the name as well. Oh, it's very interesting. I, I left EA in um, 2000, I guess late 2002, maybe early 2003. And um, I went and applied at THQ. And it was interesting. I got in there 
and they asked me to come back and apply for like the the um, head of the development group there. And I went through all that and it was going really well. And then I was told, well, there's this new guy who's now in charge of studios. I said, okay, fine. I interviewed with him and he said, no, nah, I've got somebody else um, in mind, but you're great. You know, great. And I said, okay, fine. And I left and then I applied outside and then I got this, this call from Volition to come talk to them. And I came out and talked and it went really good. They brought me on board. And uh, a year later, of course, they were owned by THQ. A year later, they I found out, well, I found out that the vice president that I was replacing had gone to THQ and that was the person that uh, um, the head of studios was talking about, Jack Sorensen, talking about uh, Philip Holt and Philip would, uh, had gone to THQ corporate. I was replacing him. And so I thought that was kind of funny, but what was even funnier was that a year later, Philip left and they, Jack called me and said, come out, come on out and, and do it. That's this job. And I said, no, <laughs> I, I, I like Volition too much. It was so much fun to be at Volition. Um, so that was kind of weird. It was uh, an interesting situation that I kind of looped around this this whole thing. Um, but Volition was um, about 55, 60 people, 60 people maybe when I got there. Um, really just high-end programmers. It was very flat structure, mostly just like senior programmers and programmers. And they had a little bit of project management, um, artists. And it was was really, it felt like almost like an indie group. It was pretty amazing. But they had just been bought, um, not that, I don't know, a few years before by THQ. And they just um, shipped sequels to Summoner and I think Red Faction mm. too. And uh, we're trying to figure out what to do next. And I was thinking about that. And we basically said, we don't want to do, they would say, well, we want to do a Space Marine game. And I'm going, ah, everybody's doing Space Marine. Let's not mm. do that. I don't, I don't think so. Um, I said, why don't we think about doing something differently? And then we put groups together from the team that was going to build the space Marine thing. And I think there was five or six people in the team and they just said, come up with ideas. And somebody came up with a, a first person gang simulator. And I said, that's really cool. I, I really like that idea. And one group had that and it's like, but let's not put it in first person. There's this company out there making, you know, getting 8 million sales off of these open world games. Maybe we should try and get into open world. And uh, so we did. Um, but that was crazy. It was insane because what I did was um, I brought with me a structure. So I brought, I brought in a studio structure. Mike was Mike Kulas, who's the, who was the founder of Volition. He said, basically you, you drive uh, development. I'll handle kind of the COO role. And he, he was executive producer of the red faction stuff. And I was the executive producer of uh, basically of the, Saints Row stuff. And so I brought in a studio structure where I had levels for people, um, job descriptions and all of that stuff and um, brought in a, a project management system and all these things. And so we had all these new things and we hired up to, we probably hired a hundred people really, really mm. fast because they said, yeah, do Saints Row. And that story is pretty funny. Let me tell you, I'll tell you that one in a minute, how we, we pitched mm. Saints Row after we told them, uh, after we uh, came up with the idea. So we put into place a new structure, a new management process for making the game itself. The production process was different and that there was more um, more planning and, and scheduling. And uh, we ended up going to the 360. So we were on a new platform in a genre we'd never been in before. So it, it, you talk about a perfect storm of crazy. It was that way. But we came up with the game idea. We had to pitch it to THQ. Mm. And THQ was all about kid games and wrestling mm. at the time. And they were all, they were doing mostly, um, you know, licensed product. And so <laughs> we made a, a, a video and it was based around, it was based, the, the song that was playing was uh, F the Police by NWA. <laughs> and we spliced together all these gang fight, you know, videos and games um, where there were gang things going on in it. And we took it in there, Mike and I took it in there and we played the video and it was called Bling Bling at the time. <laughs> and the, the concept was, it's like a music video, but gang, you know, it's kind of combining music videos and gangs. So you have hmm. gangs, guns. And, you know, that kind of stuff and, and um, gangs, guns and, and music, I think was kind of the pitch of it. And we get in there and we played this for the executive committee. There was like all the CEO, CFO, 
COO, all these folks are there, all these high level folks, marketing and all that. And we played the thing and it was dead silent afterward. I mean, mm. not a word. And then from the back of the room, the, the CEO, uh, CFO said, is this the kind of game that THQ should be making? And I'm like, oh, oh no. And Brian Farrell, to his credit, he slammed the table and said, yep, we're going to do this. And he said, go go do it. And so we came back and we had to really staff up. Like I said, we we added so many people. And it's kind of hard to do that out in the middle of Illinois. <laughs> it's The games are mostly coastal. And uh, so it was quite the, the struggle to bring in people. But we grew up to over 200 and uh, we're making two games at the same time. Uh, Saints Row on one side, and then uh, we started with Punisher. Believe it or not, we started with a Punisher game. Yeah, which I thought, yeah. Um, I, yeah, we we love Punisher. I mean, I'm mm. a, I'm a comic collector as well. I had so many Punisher comics, and there were people in the in, in the, and that's one of the reasons I said sure we should do this because THQ had the Marvel Punisher IP, and we mm. went oh cool this is great. Problem is we made him true to life like the comics. <laughs> he was he was yeah, a yeah. psychological he was a, a psychopathic <laughs> killer. You know, stuff you in a wood chipper and all that stuff. Was there much pushback with the Punisher? Because obviously, in the <laughs> UK at least, you know, it, it it got branded as a... Well, it was a very violent game, and I think there was quite a bit of censorship in a few countries for it and stuff. What well, was kind of THQ's you, What you saw that? was the completely censored version. <laughs> um, I went to the uh, ESRB here and said to them, listen, this is what we're doing. And we understand that there's going to be a problem. What should we do? And they said to us, well, you you know that movie Kill Bill? That's mm. maybe, maybe you think about it that way. That's probably the best way to approach it. You know, make it black and white. And we did. We, we, we graded out, you know, completely and all of that. And um, they're going, that's good. That's great. Okay. And so we finished it and submitted it. And it came back AO across the board. Uh, from mm. that, from the ESRB, it's like adults only, no way. And so we went and made some more changes and put it in again. And they said, "Uh, uh-uh, uh, this is still AO, no way." And so we ended up having to cut out anything, like you know, when you put the person in the wood chipper, that was not allowed. So it went black. Mm. And all you could hear was the sound, and that was the only thing we could ship. So in the end, we did not ship the game we made. We shipped the game we had to, to we had changed to uh, to suit the ESRB, and then we found out people were able to un- unlock the the yep. black. Yep. <laughs> so that was, that was a bit of a surprise. <laughs> but yeah, that was that was a fun game to make. It went really well. It was uh, everybody understood what they were making. Uh, there, we did some pretty neat stuff with it. There was uh, if you listen to the audio. We actually incorporate some, he gets into this like psychological rage, uh, killing rage. And when he's doing that, we're playing these kind of memories of the things you've done before in the game. And it's really kind of cool. Um, but yeah, it got all kind of lost in that, in that uh, ESRB thing and the uh, censorship thing. I was, I was wondering then with Saints Row, you know, how did you go about the design and think what, was GTA missing at the time? Because, you know, that was it's, one of the biggest games on earth and there were so many like GTA supposed clones coming out at the time. Well, it's, it's exactly what we were looking at. We're going, geez, you know, GTA is great, but it feels like um, they're trying to make a movie and you're driving from one movie set to the other, right? One scene set to the other. And so you're driving through this beautiful thing, but it could take you 30 minutes of just driving around just to get to the next thing you're supposed to do. And we would see people doing cool stuff in the city, but none of it was thought out or planned. And it was so, well, why don't we make a game where you're focusing on just messing around in the city? Um, that was really what we were thinking. It's like, let's do what GTA doesn't. Let's focus on just having fun in the city. And at the time, at the beginning, I don't think we were planning on missions, honestly. Then we realized you've got to have missions for a storyline. Um, and so we built them in. But um, our, our goal was just to literally give you a bunch of tools, a toolbox, basically, and let you have fun in the sandbox with it. And that, you know, that kind of idea, uh, it was funny. People don't understand. They said we cloned GTA because they came out with a gang game. Um, GTA 4 was a gang game. Well, we were already two years into production of our gang game when we found out what they were making. We would have not, it's like if we had started the game and seen that they made a gang game, we probably would have done something different. But we were already committed. We were most of the way done. The biggest thing we could do, we could change the color of our gang from green to purple. 
That's mm-hmm. the only thing we could do to respond to what they were doing because we were already fully committed. We were way deep into production. And so mm-hmm. people were saying, oh, you've cloned them. And it's like, what do you talk? You know, you don't understand production, obviously, because these things, it took us three years to make that game. Rockstar was so secretive as well. You know, nobody yeah. knew what they were. Well, you know, nobody ever knows what GTA. I remember, I remember all the stuff for GTA 4 was just the main character walking down the street. Like nobody actually yeah. knew what the game was going to be like. So for people to say, they were often so come, good yeah. at that. Mm. But I found out why partly as we made Saints Row, the first Saints Row was like, we would make a neighborhood, mm. right? And you'd build this neighborhood and then you try to scale it up like the, the uh, AI for vehicles and all that. And it wouldn't work. You mm. had to build the whole layout for the whole city and you have to build up the city all at one time and you can't do pieces you have to kind of build the whole city up and so there's nothing really to show until way late in the game and i didn't understand any of that until uh, we got farther into it and started realizing wow this is a different different dynamic when you're building open world it took us a long time to figure out all those little details and we still didn't do it right it's like um, we built our world on these areas that we sc- that we would stream in, and it was on squares in the first one. And then we're just for and but there would be a point, a four corner point. And if you hit that in your car, if this point was on the road and you hit that your car too fast, you'd be sitting in midair in a in a crash bug that we couldn't fix because it was a four corner point, and we couldn't load the right thing in at the right time and all of that. So we learned real fast that it had to be offset squares. You can't do the four corner thing. I think where Saints Row really shined for me was um, the whole reputation system within yeah. the city. So, you know, with GTA 2 and GTA 3, they had a, a fantastic kind of capturing territory with all the different gangs, and you could annoy certain gangs. You could have, you know, groupies kind of following your escorts and uh, right. uh, quite a few gang members and stuff. And then they seemed to drop that from the whole GTA series. And and Saints Row really took that whole gang reputation of your character and building up a, a kind of empire, which um, I thought was absolutely fantastic and definitely something that was missing in in that area. Yeah, we tried to do turf. We thought about turf. You know, it's funny though because the concept that we came to is um, the biggest thing that mattered in our game was just having fun. There was a point, a turning point, where someone brought up the sniper rifle. And everyone kind of got into these two camps. One camp said, you know, gangs don't use sniper rifles. What are you talking about? That's not appropriate for our game. It's not realistic. And the other group is saying it's fun. (laughs) It's just really (laughs) fun. And so we decided to go fun. And that kind of changed the way we looked at everything. Um, What's fun, right? What are we going to do that's fun? We didn't have a strong, like, vision for the detail of the game. We just had these kind of... Um, mantras kind of like this is what it should be you know customization and things like you know fun rules all things like that they were just kind of one-liners and it's funny nowadays everything's all designed out but back then it was you know you come up with kind of a, a set of like we we call them mantras you know this is the way we look mm. at the what we're t- and and they were pretty nebulous <laughs> you could put a lot of things in one of the, some of those mantras so it's yeah. weird there's a lot of humor in gta and uh you know saints row felt less rigid and more just like a wacky kind of playground you know uh, that was the goal yeah. that was the goal it's supposed to be kind of a, a a playground really give you all these crazy tools and do fun stuff with them yeah <laughs> i can't help but think of the uh, i know it was later on but the dubstep gun i think it was insane oh, 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 it was so sweet <laughs> the chum gun. i don't know if you remember the chum gun um oh, yeah you shoot it and a, a shark would come up out of the sidewalk and eat you, <laughs> Kill, eat and eat them, yeah. Yeah, that kind of stuff yeah oh, there was wow. some crazy fun stuff i think you could ride a velociraptor and i mean that stuff came out of what we called awesome, awesome week yeah the, we give them a week in the middle of production because production gets boring i mean it's really if you're really doing it right you're just really kind of putting things together and it can get boring after like months of it and so we'd stop and give them a week to come up with an idea that they had to take, not just to design all the way to something that we could put in the game, or at least mm. at a prototype level. And we had to see it. In other words, like that. And then they would do that sort of thing um, because they all knew the tools really well by then. And, and they had a really under, deep understanding of what the engine could do. So they could create something very quickly. And I don't think we ever put anything in the gun, in the game itself during that time period. but 
it went into DLC. A lot of things went into DC, DLC from that awesome. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. something we borrowed from Bethesda. They were they were mm-hmm. doing it there. It's a really good idea. So when Saints Row came out, it really filled the gap of online multiplayer that GTA didn't have back then. Was that a big focus for for the developers? You know, to go into that area because obviously, you know, it's two thousand six, two thousand and seven. And online is, you know, with Call of Duty and stuff like that, just becoming really, really big. And GTA really didn't nail it until much later on. Right. And yeah, it was important. And um, we, for us, it was really important. The question was, should we do it again in Saints Row 2? And unfortunately, mm-hmm. our data analysts got it wrong and that they said there, were, there weren't very many people playing it. Um, we probably would have stayed with it. Um, mm-hmm. We did co-op and stuff in the second and third, but um, I think that we could have kept up with a higher level of multiplayer if we'd realized that and what we found out later on was no you're wrong there's a lot of people playing it there was a lot of people and i wish and i i the question was do you spend the extra million dollars you know on multiplayer or do you put that into the rest of the game and if mm. the people aren't playing it then why would you do that well it turns out they were unfortunately <laughs> i wish we'd stayed with it because it was so much fun uh, it was um, amazing and i think it was a part of it was yeah we wanted to commit to something they weren't doing to, to separate us a little bit some of the, the co-op stuff and, and some of the later, you know, I think that was fun stuff that we put in. There were some pretty good, um, interesting games that they came to up with in terms of multiplayer and co-op. What are your memories of the marketing and uh, promotion campaign as well and the kind of uh, fun that Saints you had Row 3 was crazy out the roof. I mean, I really, what we, we over time um, with Saints Row, we ended up having this really tight partnership where they would come out really early and we would talk about stuff. I think it started with really got deep into it in Saints Row 2. And they would come out um, very early on. We're still working on design and stuff. And we would talk through all kinds of things. And we'd talk about what was important. And so it became, a, it was more than just, you know, okay, tell us what you're making down the road here and, you know, give us the assets we need. It was a partnership at the beginning of the of the cycle and it was really powerful. I think we did pretty well with that. Some of the crazy stuff they did though, man, <laughs> um, it got kind of, it got kind of way over the top. I thought it was pretty funny. I love the St. Joe 4 pack that we did where it's like the one, you buy one game for a million dollars and, and we'll give you all these things of value, you know, like a trip mm-hmm. on the Voyager and the sp- spaceship and all this, buy you cars and, uh, things like that were great. I was, I think they did an amazing job. The um, some of the taglines were, you know, strap it on. Things like that were were pretty powerful. I thought <laughs> also pretty, <laughs> pretty funny, pretty pretty in keeping with the game in some ways. Yeah, it's, it was pretty funny that way. And it also like celebrity endorsements as well. You know, oh, you had like uh, Burt Reynolds, Mila Kunis, <laughs> you had, uh, Neil Patrick Harris. Oh, yeah, who else? Um, uh, yeah, Hulk Hogan. Well, you know, right? loads of people in there. Yeah, I thought it was funny. Mila Kunish actually gave away what we were doing in the game because we, you know, you always keep your hats on. We don't, we don't tell anybody we're going to make Saints Row Three. You know what we're working on, and she put it. She spilled the in some interview. She spilled the beans and that kind of stuff. It's always funny to see that happen. We tried um, Terry uh, Crews as well. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, we tried to get Randy Savage. Um, you know, wrestler. But he wouldn't do it because it was it was he was very religious and he looked at the game and there's no way <laughs> 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 that happened more than once. That happened more than once. Yeah. Yeah. So did you ever have any of the guys from Rockstar, you know, any contact with them? Have any of them ever mentioned to you what they think of Saints Row? No, you know, that's funny. We never did. Um, we had people who went in like one of our their best technical arts we had ended up at Rockstar, but we we never heard what they said about our games. Um, I think they kind of, they kind of went, eh, you know, whatever we, <laughs> it's a, it's, it's a different world when you sell, you know, mm. six or 8 million Saints Rose and there's somebody out there selling a hundred million copies of yeah. something. <laughs> it's, kind of, <laughs> it's kind of like night and day there. I mean, it, it, it kind of, it made us feel good though, that the, that the players went from, it's just a clone to, Oh, you know what? They're different. And yeah, that, yeah. that was really positive for us. That made us feel better because we weren't trying to be that clone and we couldn't, we didn't, we weren't going to argue with them. But at the same time, there was still always that little core group of, of GTA folks who just hated us. <laughs> I, I like the idea that kind of, you know, they're working on GTA and they play Saints Row and they're having a break. Oh, <laughs> that was that's funny. Really the really the micro, Microsoft folks, the people in the first, you know, third party groups there doing the Xbox 360. 
Uh, they loved us. They said, we can't tell anybody we love you. You're our, I think they said we were your, you're our second favorite game. There was something else they were playing that they liked more, but they loved our game and, it, but they couldn't say so. Cause they said that that was the game was not appropriate <laughs> for, <laughs> to mention that they liked it that much. So I thought that was pretty funny. Oh, do, do you think it's kind of attracting a modern audience as well? Where, you know, new players as, as well as the old, cause uh, they've got the recent reboot as well. Yeah, I think they did a pretty good job on the reboot. Honestly, I thought that was well done. Um, unfortunately, five kind of hurt it. Uh, I think um, five was was painful. I'm not really. I'm you know I didn't even play it. Unfortunately, I just haven't had a chance to play it yet. I kind of moved forward. You know, like I said, I'm not a backward looking. So I'm kind of like, what's next? And so I I, I don't hold anything negative about uh, Volition. I love the company and I love the folks. And I'm just sorry they're gone. It was so special to have them here. I'm still in Champaign. It was so special to have that company here. It changed the city, having yeah. that company here. We built a building downtown and helped revitalize downtown in Champaign. And so it was pretty special what people thought of us here and and what the company did for the for the place downtown. So uh, yeah, it was a real nice nice thing. And um, I just I wish they were still around. Well. Um... Talking of uh, what's next, um, my final kind of question is, uh, you know, you're doing some consultancy and stuff now. What what do you have planned next? Actually, I'm, I didn't change. I, it's funny. I haven't updated my LinkedIn for six years. <laughs> it's kind of funny. But I moved from, I, as soon as I quit, I think within a few months, I got a call from the university here. And they said, because I, I thought about, do I really want to leave Champagne Because I got grandkids here and all that sort of thing. There's only so many positions, right, at a GM or a VP level out there. So you have to you have to move and whatever. And I decided I didn't want to. And they called from the University of Illinois here and asked me if I'd come over. They didn't have a game program. They didn't really have any courses in games. And they asked me to teach. And so I started teaching um, in 2018 at the U of I. And uh, there were four of us kind of started the game studies program. And now we have a game studies program. We have a master's program coming online in the fall of next year, um, and we're growing the focus on games. So people at U of I just love games from the students to the professors. The problem is it wasn't a, a focus of the, there was no games interest really. And now it's kind of changing quite a bit. We're doing a lot of things that are focused. I have a little studio there, all students and the students. I'm. What I found when I got there was that the industry needs process they need understanding of how to make something and universities have programs have a tendency to create skill-based things so we have a lot of skills coming out of the universities but there's not a lot of process coming out and process equates to experience if you understand how to do it you have you know you can it doesn't take you long to develop experience and so the what we focused on at the u of i now is this concept of um experiential um studio work and so i have this little tiny studio it was only four five students six students now i guess and me but we don't make games we actually have a database of students on campus that want to help make games and we pay them we hire them as little stu- as little studio groups or as little teams and we build different products for professors and for external groups so we're actually teaching process to all the students that come in and hire in we use industry tools and industry methodologies and go through that, you know, like code review and all these things that are, you kind of teach the students the necessities of the industry. And that's where we're focused on. And um, we're kind of, it's, it seems to be doing really, really well. We're, uh, we're running like six projects, five or six projects right now. I, so I, I that, think that's and awesome. And I think, I think that's great that you're also bringing something back to Champagne as well. Yeah. This is a wonderful area. It's a little hot in the summer. It's a little flat, but it's, it's, I mean, I'm a West coast guy, but I've been here for 20 years. And so I kind of, uh, I just, I made connections at the U of I when I was at Volition, hoping that we could make deeper, um, connections with this high-end engineering groups and, but they don't have a, a digital art program at U of I. So now we're, we're starting in our game studies to create courses on, on digital art for the students and, all of that. So it's, it's really, um, it's, it's come quite a ways from where we were, which was, we want to do something with U of I and U of I was just really not able to pull it together with us um, to the point where now it's like the students have gone crazy for games and 
we're doing all kinds of fun things. So yeah, I, awesome. I feel like, yeah, I feel like we getting into it by getting into it later. U of I actually has a, a different view of how to make or how to do um, game studies, right? Because when we, when most of the uh, game studies programs were started, they focused on skills because there just wasn't very many good skill sets out there. We were all indies and self-taught and crazy. And now everybody's very, very skilled. It's amazing the skill sets that are coming out of university, but they're not, you know, they just don't know what to do with the skills. And that's where I think is, is the next level needs to be. Sounds like um, it's kind of started something there and you've helped build a foundation. So that's well, wicked. Uh, hopefully we'll see some great stuff coming out in the future. I hope so. It's it's kind of fun. Um, we're we're working with every kind of tool because it's work for hire, right? So you just yeah. you have to learn everything. You have to learn VR and AR and um, different platforms and 2D, 3D, all of it. Maybe one day Saints Row VR. <laughs> no, that, no, that would be crazy. <laughs> the, the one downside to to university is and development is semester to semester. The students come and go. Workforce is very interesting to try to handle. It's different. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you, Dan. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I really, really enjoyed that interview. Oh, sure. I enjoyed it too. Thank you so much for having me. It was really great. Uh, your, your podcasts are wonderful.